Hey, Happy New Year's, everyone. We're now one year away from 2025. And you know what that means. We're on the cusp of having access to nano gloves, invisibility suits, and fully automated drone warfare vulnerable to mass hacks. Trolling inbound. The fact this game is almost 12 years old and I remember playing it when it was new makes me feel very uncomfortable. But no, 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 we're not talking about the existential dread of aging today. If you were around in the late 90s and early 2000s, which I wasn't technically, but take my word for it, your options for playing World War II shooters are kinda limited. Aside from the occasional poorly made era-themed mod for games like Doom or Duke Nukem on PC, Medal of Honor back in its heyday was the only real example of a popular shooter set during the highly acclaimed sequel to the war to end all wars. And don't get me wrong, while it's been a while since I played a Medal of Honor game, I did play the original for PS1 a few years back, and it's good, I like it enough. It's certainly well remembered for a reason. And you can tell I'm not the only one who thinks that way, because for three years straight, it basically held a monopoly on the subgenre, culminating in the unholy year of my birth, 2002, with the game everyone remembers best from the series, Allied Assault. And if you've never played it before, this right here is why everyone remembers it so fondly. Correct me if I'm wrong, I don't care by the way, but as far as my knowledge goes, this is the first example of a D-Day mission in a major game series. Hey, do you think the devs saw Saving Private Ryan at all? I, I can't tell. But this one mission in particular is important to note, because in a series that up to this point revolved around Lone Wolf and Special Operations, an actual well-designed large-scale battlefield mission in World War II, especially one as important as the D-Day landings, was refreshing to see at the time. And just as Medal of Honor had monopolized the World War II aesthetic in 1999, a new series that you may or may not have heard of before was about to come sprinting around the corner to not only snatch this cash cow away, but fucking milk it for years on end in one of those industrial milker machines until it dried up into a skeleton thin husk of what it once was, to the point where even no one else wanted to touch it for upwards of an entire decade. Infinity Ward is probably best known in the COD fanbase for being the studio that created the Modern Warfare trilogy and more infamously known for developing the poorly received but honestly not that bad games, COD Ghosts and Infinite Warfare. Yeah, you know what, I'm tired of being silenced by golden era elitism. Ghost appreciators, rise up. I know that there are at least one more of you out there, but their most important contribution to the series would probably have to be its literal creation. Founded by a small team of devs that all previously helped to develop Allied Assault, Infinity Ward in 2002 began work on a brand new id Tech 3 based project that they dubbed Medal of Honor Killer. Sounds ballsy maybe, but for good reason. It can't be understated just how revolutionary the game Call of Duty was. A large chunk of its development time was spent on creating cutting edge AI behavior, and while some of it doesn't hold up as well. <laughs> A lot of it is also pretty impressive when you consider this game came out in 2003. I mean, Half-Life 2 would come out only a year later, and its AI, while good, still doesn't hold a candle to COD 1. Soldiers in-game will tactically advance from cover to cover, throw, and, very important qualifier, effectively run away from grenades, point out where enemies are, and attempt to flank from multiple directions while laying down suppressive fire. I mean, most of the time you'd have seen stuff like this in games up to that point, it was usually in part or entirely scripted, but here, Nah, the AI just does this because it's able to and actively wants to kill its opponents. It's a major stepping stone in FPS history, and it's still fun to play to this very day. A certified classic that deserves to be remembered for all time. So it's a shame that I honestly hate playing at least a third of it. You're on the obstacle course and doing weapons training today. Before starting the obstacle course, read each of these important signs and do what they tell you. Good. Now check your objectives. It may seem a bit superfluous by today's standards given how ubiquitous COD's influence on FPS control schemes has become, but this is a pretty well made and quick to play through boot camp mission. I mean, I'd still prefer the boot camps from opposing forces or even Sarge's heroes, but it's a nice reminder of a fun bygone era I'd like to return to when FPS games were more dynamically designed. 
You guys ever played Foxhole? I'm also not sure exactly why an 82nd Airborne guy is training alongside a squad of 101st Airborne soldiers, but I'd be lying if I said it bothered me at all though. Hold your pretentious rants r slash history followers. The level is divided up in between two sections, with Captain Foley first running through the game's physical mechanics, how to check your completed and incomplete mission objectives, and the proper types of cover that can be mantled over, crawled under, and climbed over. Weapons training, however, is run through by Sergeant Moody, covering the mechanics mechanics for semi-auto and automatic weapons, as well as sniper training. I hope it's clear to you that you will be more accurate while aiming down the sight. I always liked how in COD training missions, the trainer will take the time to explain that aiming down sights improves your accuracy over hip firing. Although, to be fair, I guess that was a relatively new thing in 2003, so it kind of fits better here over, say, Modern Warfare 2. He also explains the mechanics for meleeing, and instead of just having a knife to swipe with like in later entries, the damage you deal is based upon the size and thickness of the butt of your weapon you have in hand. So while hardwood rifles like the M1 Garand or the Car 98 can knock down an enemy in a single hit, weapons with a minimal stock like the M1 Carbine or MP40 do very light damage in comparison. Unless you're as dumb Get as you are in the ass. Grenade training in hindsight is also probably the wackiest bit of gameplay here. Nowadays, Call of Duty is best known for its sort of pick-two weapon system of carrying, but in the first COD and its respective expansions, you actually have four weapon slots. Two for primaries, one for a secondary, and one for all grenade types. Because there's no dedicated grenade throwing button in this game, no, 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 that wouldn't come around until 2005, you can make the argument that having to actually pull out your grenades to throw them makes the game a bit more tactical, but eh... I still prefer just having a keybind for tossing frags. Also, shout out to everyone watching who sucked at throwing these through windows as a kid. Fire in the hole! Good job, Private. Well done. Keep your weapons with you and clean at all times. You are dismissed. So seeing that Allied Assault's D-Day mission took place during the beach landings on June the 6th, Infinity Ward decided to do something different, and open up the American campaign with the airborne landings that started on June the 5th. And being that your player character, Private Martin, is a Pathfinder, you're dropped in ahead of the main landing forces to set up a beacon to mark your company's main landing zone. You're meant to rally up with one Sergeant Heath, but uh, he ain't looking too good when you find him. So it's up to you to carry out the objective on your own. There's this bunker you have to clear just in front of the marked position you have to place the beacon, and for as long as I can remember, I've always cleared it out with a grenade. I accidentally threw too low this time around and managed to damage myself a bit, and I feel very ashamed of that. I almost restarted the level. Almost. Of course, conveniently after placing down the beacon, the invasion immediately starts. <laughs> But instead of paratroopers from the 101st, you're met with some 82nd boys. This is actually a pretty cool detail that's subtly pointing at the fact that the airborne drops of June the 6th were marred with scattered and off-course landings that saw infantry of the 82nd and 101st alike coming together to form ad hoc but still understrength units in order to accomplish their objectives. Your objective in particular being the capture of St. Mary Glees, a critical town along the main highway leading to the designated landing zones along the Normandy coast. Approaching the town from the east, you come under heavy MG and mortar fire as you make your assault. Big ups to you if you're able to save these two soldiers every single time you play this level. Slowly forcing your way into the Fallschirm Jaeger garrison town, you're given the task of taking out a few flak panzers close to the infamous St. Maragli's church. Being that you're in the middle of enemy territory and bunkered down in an important town, the Germans predictably want you gone. And in the morning hours following last night's battle, you're met with a counterattack of infantry and armor. Can't wait to see all the comments saying, um, actually, there were no tigers present in Normandy during the invasion. I don't care. I don't care. Swarming in from all directions of the town, you slowly whittle down their offensive before the Krauts opt to just bombard your positions. So in a final sweep, you assault the mortar position set up on the outskirts of the town, ending the German attacks. But with the situation looking grim for your unit, you're assigned along with Moody and Elder to rush through German lines and request support from a nearby Allied field headquarters. Okay, Captain. Assuming we get back to battalion in this rolling junkyard, what do I tell them? 
hand this directly to Major Shepard. Tell him Baker Company has secured the town, but won't be able to hold it long if we don't get relief soon. Got that, Sergeant? Oh, yes, sir, you bet. We ride through enemy lines in a French tin can. Want to paint a bullseye on it, sir? <laughs> yeah, pretty sure that won't be necessary, Sarge. Well, hold on there, Sergeant, before wildly tailgating it back to battalion, and in case I don't make it back, I need to tell you something very important. And that is that this video is sponsored by our very first ever sponsor, Enlisted. For those of you who don't know what Enlisted is, it is a free-to-play and devoted-to-history World War II FPS available for PC and consoles alike that seamlessly combines PvP and PvE combat in large, action-filled online battles. Bro, actually watch this. This is literally saving Private Ryan. Literally saving Private Ryan. Take command of an AI tank crew or squad of infantry, or even take to the skies as you tactically maneuver your way across multiple pivotal World War II battlefields, fighting other enemy players and their own AI squads alike. You can even customize the loadouts and appearance of your men, all across the game's diverse and historically authentic factions. Germany, the USSR, the Japanese Empire, and of course, the good old US of A. And with over 400 iconic weapons and unique vehicles to choose from, there are countless different roles, play styles, and strategies to mindfully utilize alongside your fellow squad leads, all in the name of your ultimate victory. For anyone who hasn't picked up the game in a hot minute, you'll be happy to hear Enlisted is better than ever, as they recently dropped a huge update, totally overhauling various aspects about the game, all based on community feedback including improvements to matchmaking, balancing, and player progression. But for all of you new would-be recruits, Enlisted is offering a tantalizing sign-on bonus. By using my link as listed in the description, new players on PC will receive a free bundle of gear, 4,000 silver, and three whole days of premium account status. But be sure to blitz your way to that link quickly, as this offer is available for only a limited time. So, what's the delay? Download Enlisted today, and I'll see you on the front. Thanks again to the Enlisted team for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to it. Yeah, this mission is, uh something all right is it bad no it's not it's at least very entertaining i like the dialogue between elder and moody can't believe i agreed to do this you did. And it's short and sweet as well, so it's not much of a roadblock. As you can probably tell, Call of Duty even in its early days was still tongue-in-cheek like it is now, so that hasn't changed. The next level after this, however, isn't just fine or good, but is a masterpiece in COD's long history of well-designed levels. And if you've played this game before, you'd also probably agree. Yes, we've reached the attack on Brekor Manor. And if you haven't played COD 1 before and that name sounds familiar, then you probably know it from its appearance in Band of Brothers. I'd make a joke about plagiarism, but it was historically a pretty small contained fight, so I think Call of Duty can get away with some similarities fine enough. Just like during the actual battle, your goal is to sabotage the large guns on the property shelling Utah Beach. Heads up! Get back! Yeah, like I said before, some parts of the AI haven't aged as well. Of course, you have the sections of the level where you clear out the main batteries and their surrounding trenches, even a part where you have to support Moody while he rescues a wounded soldier. And I can't stress enough how well-designed the level terrain and defensive works are. I think more so than any other COD 1 level, if you die on this mission at all, it's completely your fault. Bitch. Look at all the cover provided to you from enemy infantry, the opportunities for picking off machine gunners from bushes or from throwing grenades. God, it's just so fucking good. But it's not over yet, because you even have to secure the actual manor itself from the Fallstrom Jaeger garrison. Hey, pre-production Ethan here. I just want you to know that that line took like fucking five minutes to say. And it's been a while since I've watched Band of Brothers, but I don't remember it even appearing there during the fighting. And after securing the building and mowing down a couple squads with an MG42, you destroy the final gun and save the day for a Utah beach. Easy company? I call that Private Martin Company in my book. Unfortunately, we've reached the peak of the American campaign. It's not going to get this good again, because for the next hour at least, this game takes a bit of a nosedive and becomes a chore to play. Well, it seems that someone at command noticed your actions. 
Our unit has been detached from the rest of the 101st so that it can be used for some special missions behind enemy lines. I've never regretted performing as well as I have now. Please, send me back to the front line. I don't care if you have to put me in a goddamn penal battalion. Fuck! Despite being regular airborne infantry, you and your squad are inserted deep into Nazi territory all the way up in the Austrian Alps, with the next two missions in the US campaign revolving around rescuing future reoccurring characters. Captain Price, presumably the father or grandfather of his more popular counterpart, and Major Ingram of the SAS. Listen guys, I like Dirty Dozen just fine. It's a funny movie, sure, but you can't do this to me. You can't go from D-Day to an evil Nazi mansion. You just can't. Please. Okay, well all things considered, this first mission isn't all that bad, even if you're playing Lone Wolf for a good chunk of it. You can really tell this game was designed by former Medal of Honor developers because this feels like a location straight out of that franchise. The mansion is pretty intricately designed and packed with a number of secret passageways, even comes with a revolving fireplace like in Indiana Jones. And you go down into the cellar area where you find Captain Price, and he tells you that inconveniently the SS has moved him, and only him, from the mansion to a prison camp a few miles away. So, I can tolerate the mansion level because at least you can freely explore a cool and well-designed big building that reminds you of an 80s action-adventure film. I can't tolerate the prison camp level though, I don't like it. And where to begin? So one thing that makes itself painfully obvious as soon as the mission begins, Call of Duty 1's AI is not designed at all for anything stealthy or sneaky, because the level designers expect you to start the mission off by sniping the machine gunners at the camp's gates which I do for demonstration purposes, and immediately as soon as you shoot, all the Germans locate you instantly and begin shooting at you. They're not even shocked, they just get at you. And as soon as you shoot, an alarm is raised and you're given a time limit to complete the entire level. Yes, the game with the single limited health bar that tries to encourage a tactical playstyle expects you to hustle and blast your way through a compact and well-garrisoned environment with old-timey, somewhat unwieldy selection of weapons. Is it impossible? No, obviously not, but it seems completely antithetical to the entire point of this game's existence, to provide an authentic World War II experience, but instead, I feel like fucking G.I. Rambo. But eventually you find Ingram, the limey bastard, and you backtrack the hell out of Dodge. There's still one more US mission to talk about, but that's not until later. Let's get to that hate-filled one-third I mentioned earlier. How about a funny joke, audience? What do you get when you cross a game with frontline tuned battlefield AI with a mission roster designed around stealth and special ops? I'll tell you what you get. You get the fucking British campaign from the original Call of Duty. Out of the original COD trilogy, this is easily the weakest campaign present. I even remember hating it when I was a dumbass 10-year-old kid. And 10-year-old me loved Ghost and thought Phantom Menace was the best prequel film. Actually, those two things are still true, so maybe I really am the issue here. But there is somewhat of a silver lining. For one thing, it's kind of short, and it also has a strong start with the first two levels. Gotta warn you though, it's like a window into something that we never got, and it makes me pretty sad. We're introduced to this campaign with another perspective of the D-Day invasion. This time, we're fighting along British glider infantry in Bonneville, France during the Battle for Pegasus Bridge, a vital route over the Con Canal into Normandy. And for anyone who thinks it's unrealistic you're involved in this hard landing and managed to go unnoticed by the Germans guarding the bridge, that's actually what happened in real life. In fact, the devs probably could have gotten away with putting the crash glider a tad bit closer. The initial resistance you're met with is very light, and maybe only a couple of squads of Germans on either side of the bridge. There's also a single panzer they try to throw at you, which you dispatch with one of the German Flak 88s. You may say it's a bit odd there are no Piats here, but as far as I know, that's accurate to the equipment during this phase of the battle. Hasn't stopped Infinity Ward before though, eh? After securing the bridge, we continue the battle the following day during the afternoon of June 6th. And now the Germans are really mad and try forcing their way into the town after encircling your position, holding the western side of the bridge before partially being overwhelmed and forced to fall back to the eastern side. While holding the west bank you're met with just infantry but as soon as you hit the east an entire squad of panzers suddenly arrives hell bent on blowing you all to hell but remember you have the most effective german anti-tank weaponry at your disposal so one tapping their armor isn't really an issue you do this for five minutes before being relieved by elements of what i assume are the seventh parachute battalion bringing the battle for pegasus bridge to an end and thus bringing my enjoyment for this roster to an end as well let's talk about oof Aider Dam. 
I do have one pretty positive thing I want to say about it, and that is, like a lot of the large buildings in this game, the dam itself is pretty well designed. That's where my compliments end. The main objective of the level is to clear a number of anti-air guns and cannons in anticipation for an imminent bomber run from the famous Dam Busters, who I 100% would prefer to be playing as right now. And every sin COD 1 can commit is committed here. The broken opening attempt at stealth, no friendly NPCs to distract from the likely meth-fueled hyper-attentive Nazi soldiers. And when you reach the very end of this relatively long level, you have to backtrack through the entire thing again, which was totally fun and and I totally love doing it. <sighs> okay. Honestly, there was potential here if the game just gave you a squad or two of friendlies to fight alongside you. If a whole platoon of normal 101st guys can be inserted into fucking Austria of all places, why can't one glider's worth of commandos be dropped into Ader, a place not even that deep into Germany? I don't get the logic here. But it doesn't stop there, friend. In the wise words of Ozzy Osbourne, there's no rest for the wicked. Because after fleeing the dam, you're pursued by an entire German default template motor division from Hoi 4 down the mountain. And it's just so dull. The main reason why the car chase with Moody works well is because for one thing the back and forth between him and Elder is funny, and the spraying and praying with the Thompson without any real risk of dying is not necessarily adrenaline rushing, but it at least feels kinda badass, like a Bonnie and Clyde kinda thing. This chase isn't like that though, just shoot at all the trucks with your Bren gun until the level's over, and whenever you see a guy with the Panzerfaust, just shoot a rocket at him. Even while watching the footage back, it feels like I'm seeing this level for the first time because it's just so boring boring and forgettable. It's just fucking static. The airport mission isn't that good either. The bulk of it you'll just spend on the AA gun next to the runway trying to shoot down stukas that can kill you with a single bomb, while you're also being shot at and taking damage from squads of infantry. And you're probably thinking it's no big deal because your buddies, all two of them, will keep the Germans occupied for you. No, they don't. They suck at their job. And you can't really do anything about it yourself because if you dismount the gun for more than five seconds, the dive bombers I was just talking about will kill you. I know this looks bad, but luckily this is the lowest that COD 1 stoops, which means it's thankfully all uphill from here. And very thankfully, the next mission, which ironically is hated by everyone I know who's played it, is actually pretty good in my opinion, because now we're boarding the Bismarck-class battleship, Turpitz. Similarly to Ader Dam, my biggest compliment for Turpitz is that the setting is pretty cool, and also one I wish we could see more often in games. Walking along the deck of the ship and getting a good look at the uniforms of the German Marines, entering a hangar and going down below the engine room and even going up into the bridge and getting a good look at the communications equipment. <laughs> okay, I actually feel kind of bad for killing the captain. And even if there is a little backtracking, it doesn't overstay its welcome. Unfortunately though, boys, Captain Price does not make it out of this one. He was one fine man. The worst part about this death is that this easily makes the previous Alpine Ray totally superfluous. <laughs> You know, I'm honestly surprised Call of Duty managed to avoid getting sued for plagiarism with how much it almost one for one copies certain scenes from Enemy at the Gates. Yeah, we'll talk about this in a minute. Even if this introductory mission to the Soviet campaign is pretty short and you don't even really get to shoot anything, it sets the mood for the campaign for the next few levels pretty perfectly. That being that the Russian situation in Stalingrad is extremely desperate, and their grasp on holding this key city is on the very fringe of being lost. After all, this city isn't Kursk, nor is it Kiev, nor Minsk, 
This is Stalingrad. It bears the name of the boss, the shriveled dick bastard. So naturally, the Red Army has deployed waves upon waves of infantry to the city to blunt the Germans' attempts to secure it. Following this guy around, Sergeant Borodin, you hunker down in a safe, commissarless ruin and wait for a massive artillery bombardment to obliterate the German defensive works along the Volga Bank. And this is where the true action begins, along with taking even more inspiration from Hollywood. Victory or death! <laughs> Okay, if you clicked on this video, that probably means you're here mostly or entirely for a COD 1 review. So, if you understandably don't actually give a shit about a gay zoomer ranting about World War II history and you just want to hear the rest of my thoughts on the gameplay, skip to this time. I briefly mentioned in my COD 2 video about how Soviet soldiers being mowed down en masse by blocking detachments is a pretty common historical myth portrayed in World War II media, which made a lot of people basically go, nuh uh, in the comment section. Some of them even called me a communist, which is probably funny to hear for those of you who know me in real life. Slaves, they may not literally even be human. <laughs> Now, don't get me wrong, I generally don't care about historical inaccuracies in films or games. I believe first and foremost that, unless you're making a documentary, the main goal of media and storytelling is to make you feel emotion, to inspire you, make you happy, sad, or in the case of anything war-related, disgusted and dirty feeling. And history stuff is no different. Like, I used to know this guy who really, really hated the movie Fury because of a few scenes where the tanks weren't using proper historical strategies or whatever. And I never once thought he was smart for it, I just thought he was a sociopath. Insert your own jabs at World of Tanks r slash history and every tank tuber ever down below. If you make me laugh, you get hearted. That all said, I will concede that sometimes an historical inaccuracy like this one can manage to be legit insulting. Because outside of a few completely unbiased memoirs published by guys who totally weren't Nazis and were just following orders, guys. There are no credible accounts to back up any instances of entire units of Soviet soldiers being summarily executed in the field by blocking detachments. Under Order 227, typically the worst a Red Army soldier would get from a blocking detachment is a burst of fire into the air or a scolding from an NKVD douchebag. Although, in fairness, there were a decent number of instances of NCOs and COs being sent to penal battalions for not keeping their men in line. But that's certainly a step above what we see in COD 1. Furthermore, during the Battle of Stalingrad, no soldiers weren't just rushed into the city without weapons and ammo. Believe it or not, modern infantry are kinda useless without guns and pointlessly sacrificing them is a complete waste of manpower. Manpower that, contrary to popular belief, the Soviet Union has shortages of for large portions of the war. And while there were a few instances of troops being moved into the city lacking machine guns and AT equipment, as well as units arriving at staging areas outside the city without weapons, by the time they found themselves crossing the Volga River, they would have had some kind of rifle in hand with plenty of ammo to spare. Hell, the very division your player character is placed in, the 13th Guards, didn't even cross over into the city until they had already been fully equipped with small arms and heavy weaponry alike. This scene, awesome as it is, would be infinitely more accurate even if it meant you were dual-wielding DP-20 with a PTRS on your back. Now don't get it twisted, I hate the USSR as much as the next person with even a halfway functioning frontal lobe. The Soviet government did some pretty awful things to its own soldiers both during and after the war. Court martials, tribunal executions, imprisonment for thought crime, slave labor and gulags, you name it. But this, this is one of the few things they didn't do. The next mission is a certified classic. You charge across the empty stretch of Red Square towards City Hall under a hail of machine gun and tank fire with pretty much all the soldiers around you being killed on the onset of each new wave. So alongside Sergeant Makarov, assumably the man whose grandson would go against the grandson of Captain Price, you fight your way to the top of an apartment building where you snipe the German officers and whittle down their numbers before a further artillery bombardment takes out their tanks, and you push on beyond Red Square, thus securing a good foothold in the city. There's a few months time jump between levels, and we find ourselves conducting a solo patrol through the Stalingrad sewer system. By this time in the campaign, the German 
6th Army and 4th Panzer Corps have just recently been encircled within the city. And this level isn't mind-blowing or anything, but I do appreciate it. The sewers during the battle provided both sides with quick and vital methods of flanking and fleeing enemy troops, as well as transporting supplies between street blocks and providing opportunities for ambushes. As such, fighting and patrolling were both very common underground, just like they were above ground. And the German on the loudspeaker trying to compel Red Army soldiers to surrender subtly conveys a sense of desperation and last resortism now that the Wehrmacht armies know there's a good chance they're coming close to being completely destroyed. Comrades of the Soviet Union, there is no need for this senseless bloodshed between our nations. The German people are not your enemy. If you surrender, you will be treated well. I know this guy is a Nazi and all, but he actually said that pretty damn menacingly. But come on, you know what's coming next. We've finally reached Pavlov's house. Another absolute classic revolving around the infamous apartment block bearing the name of the sergeant who captured and held it for almost three months straight. Not sure why exactly we're capturing it again in late November, but that's not important. After picking off the snipers in the windows and securing the whole building, your squad is attacked by a mass of tanks and infantry. Bouncing from AT gun to AT gun, you disable each panzer that's brung up and gun down the soldiers who manage to force their way into the building. And it's very tense as health pickups are limited, and although it's greatly scaled down, you're also outnumbered by your attackers, like in reality. But after a few waves, you're finally relieved by T-34 support and infantry reinforcements. From this point on, the tables have turned, and the Red Army is now completely on the offensive. We skip ahead a few years to 1945, and find ourselves in Warsaw during the Vistula Oder Offensive, which would see the... liberation of the majority of Poland. Thank you! Titan has freed us! Oh, I wouldn't say free. More like under new management. <laughs> Fighting for the control of a large tank repair facility, we get a small taste of urban combat with the Germans on the defensive. And it's pretty good, even if I don't have much unique to say about it. All right, but now we have to return to the not so fun parts of this game and talk about the token tank level. And let me tell you, as far as Call of Duty goes, this is as bad as it gets. But what exactly is it that makes the tank so unfun in Call of Duty 1? and by extension, games like United Defensive. What is the biggest crack in our- The combat fucking sucks. Tank fights in pretty much any Call of Duty game can be boiled down to advance a little, park for 30 seconds or more, and rapidly spam the trigger button until each enemy tank is dead. Rinse and repeat. There's no penetration, no obvious variation in armor thickness around the hull. There's just a generic blast that takes maybe two, three, hell, maybe why not even four hits to destroy an enemy tank with. But maybe that can be partially remedied with good map design, right? The first half of the stage is just utterly dull. No real detail to the terrain, just a mostly flat and open stretch of land for enemy tanks to easily snipe you in. And that big ass river may as well not even be there at all, because those panzers just drive through it as casually as a Latvian driver speeding through traffic lanes. But the second half is even worse. Combine the dull combat in your underpowered turret and add in AT infantry cramped in bombed out buildings and being lone wolf for half the time. Are you kidding me? Oh, of course after completing the objective I get one, one fucking T-34 to help me. But thankfully as soon as that's ended we can now get to the remaining three missions. Before rolling credits, Call of Duty graces us with one final mission from each campaign. The first of these is from the American perspective during the Siege of Bastogne, with Captain Foley leading a brief raid on some German bunkers to acquire enemy intelligence. Not a whole lot to say really, it's a pretty fun little mission that also ends with you manning an 88 to destroy a panzer. Great job on those- Private Martin, You've done yourself proud. I can hardly believe. God. Captain, sir, can we just get married and live on a farm for the rest of our lives? Please? I I know you want kid. We can we can adopt. The next level is also set during that same winter in Germany and is from the British campaign and is quite a bit longer. It's also not that good as you can probably predict. The premise is cool with your ultimate objective being to destroy a V2 rocket launch site. But there are just so many MG emplacements placed around the level and they all spot you so easily. Because, like before, any attempt this game makes at stealth fails miserably and they just laser focus on you. There's hardly even any cover for properly flanking them. 
Oh my god, Waters, would you just distract him for two fucking seconds? And now, finally, the piece de resistance. Because Call of Duty 1 ends on a very high note with the storming of the Reichstag. Does this look like Berlin? No. Do I know why that T-34 won't shoot this tiger unless I plant TNT on it? Nope. But none of that matters, because there is no better feeling than fighting your way to the top of the German parliament and seeing the waving Russian flag in the wind as that cinematic heroic music kicks in. Get that flag up! Call of Duty 1. Is it perfect? Nah. Has it aged poorly in some areas? Yeah, I think to some extent it has. But this is still, to the current day, an awesome game. And it, for good reason, holds a very special place in the hearts and minds of so many people. And in the midst of this age of Warzone expansions and half-baked releases, there's never been a better time to revisit this gaming classic and see firsthand what used to make this series so great. I want to give one last huge thank you to the team behind Enlisted for sponsoring me today. They are the first ever sponsor for the channel, and they are definitely helping me out a ton by doing so. And plus, they've honestly made a really fun game that I actually enjoy playing, and I have no doubt that you will too. And remember, by following the link down in the description, new players will be given a huge boost in the form of multiple pieces of equipment, 4,000 silver, and three premium account days. Again, this is a limited time offer so check it out ASAP. Come on, you've got to. Thanks for watching and I think you know what's next.